good afternoon. Um, thank you everybody for coming and welcome to uh, the latest of the Maritime Skills Commission uh, webinars. Uh, my name is Graham Baldwin. I'm the Vice Chancellor of the University of Central Lancashire, but also have the privilege of being the chair of the Maritime Skills Commission. Hopefully, uh, most of you now are aware of the uh, Maritime Skills Commission or the MSC. But if not, I'd just like to do a brief introduction, if I may. Uh, the Maritime Skills Commission was, was first announced in the Maritime 2010 to 20 strategy. Uh, and the idea behind it is really to ensure a supply of talented people to serve all parts of the maritime industry. And that, of course, includes shipping, ports, leisure, marine, engineering, science, professional services, uh, et cetera. We've been operating um, mainly since last July. We received the tasking letter from the minister on the 1st of July, which set out the broad objectives of the Commission, which we are now working to. And fundamentally, they are to understand the skills needs, uh, particularly the effects of technological change uh, on the industry, to ensure there are no serious skills shortages or indeed skills gaps, ensure that the industry has the apprenticeships it needs, uh, that it has the training provision it needs, to provide information regarding career paths through the industry, uh, to ensure a supply of good quality recruits to the industry and of course to increase exports of education and training. And the Commission to undertake this work is working closely with the Diversity and Maritime Task Force and the Careers Task Force. In terms of the composition of the Commission, there are 19 uh, Commissioners, including myself, and if you want to find out more about the individual uh, commissioners, uh, little biogs are available on the website. We're also doing podcasts uh, and a number of those have been published to date. So you can certainly find out more about my, myself. You can also find out uh, more about uh, Ian McKinnon, the, the lead uh, commissioner on digital learning, uh, if you go to the, uh, the website. But I'm particularly pleased with the composition of the commission because we are made up of senior representatives from right across the sector. Um, people who are great ambassadors uh, for their part of the sector, but for the maritime industry as a whole. Uh, they are very passionate about skills. And I have to say that uh, everybody who was invited to join the Commission uh, accepted without uh, any hesitation. And uh, we've proven to be able to work uh, very effectively together, which I'm uh, particularly pleased about. The Commission also has good geographical coverage. So we, the, the commissioners uh, come from uh, all parts of the UK and um, we've got uh, a good gender balance uh, and so forth. We've been busy in our first year, a number of projects underway that are enabling us to fulfill the objectives that we've been set. Uh, we published a labor market intelligence report uh, back in uh, uh, September of, uh, of last year. Uh, a big piece of work is underway with regard to seafarer uh, education, looking at uh, a review of seafarer cadet education uh, specifically. We've got a project underway looking at uh, the workforce uh, requirements for uh, ports of the future, which is very exciting. Uh, we've got a project uh, that's uh, underway around uh, further exploring how we export maritime education and training, even to a greater extent than we do currently. And we've also just started a project with regard to careers in maritime uh, ashore. Now, the way that we go about doing this, we uh, commission new bits of work, but we're also very conscious of ensuring that we uh, make use of information that's already available, uh, trying to avoid duplication. And therefore, we have a, a big focus on evidence gathering, and we have a, an evidence gathering session coming up uh, where the commission will uh, invite contributions from colleagues. Uh, that's happening in July and we'll be focusing uh, on green skills and getting a better understanding of the requirements uh, around green skills in the maritime industry uh, moving forward. As I say, all of that information is available on the web website and I would encourage you to take a look to find out more about the uh, exciting work of the Maritime Skills Commission. But one of the projects, of course, that I didn't mention in that introduction is the project around digital learning. Uh, particularly uh, important uh, as a consequence of the uh, very different circumstances that we've all operated in in the last year. There have been some um, 
tremendous change in terms of delivery, uh, which almost happened overnight. I mean, one of the really interesting things uh, in uh, our education providers was the, the very, very rapid change for the majority from delivering in one way to delivering in a very different way uh, using uh, digital means as a support. And uh, it's been quite incredible. And this is therefore a really exciting project. So uh, to talk more about it, I'm gonna hand over to a number of colleagues, but uh, firstly, to provide a further introduction, I'd like to introduce you to um, the, the lead commissioner for this particular project, Ian McKinnon. Ian, thank you very much. Uh, thanks very much, Graham. Uh, I'm really pleased that everybody's been able to make some time for this. I hope we've got an interesting, I think, well, I'm sure we've got an interesting session for you. Um, digital learning's not new, of course. Uh, I think it was probably in the mid 90s that I evaluated an online learning project in the polymers industry, where ambitious software designers were racing ahead of learners struggling with a 56K modem, uh, quite unable to download the excellent learning material that had been created for them. Much more positively, many of you uh, on in this gathering uh, from academic institutions to private companies have, be, have very well developed expertise in digital learning. It's very clear from the report, however, that the swift shift to digital learning a year ago that Graham talked about was quite a shock for many providers across the sector. Uh, stressful and frantic for all concerned is the words that uh, you'll see in the report. Providers had to learn fast uh, and they did so to the great credit of all concerned. The Commission initiated this project to capture the lessons learned from that rapid shift whilst they're still fresh and to help education and provider, education and training providers across the whole sector to reflect on those lessons and to embrace the most beneficial new practice. It's clear from the report that challenges remain, uh, but I don't suppose anybody thinks uh, that we'll simply go back to the way things were uh, before the pandemic struck. Too many people have seen the opportunities that digital learning offers. We set up a small steering group uh, for the project. Uh, that my, was myself and three fellow commissioners, Colin McMurray, Catherine Nielsen and Nikki Sayer, working with Chrissy Clark, who provides the Commission Secretariat, and you've all had contact with Chrissy in signing on for this. Uh, we ran a small tender in the autumn, which Solent University won. Uh, and we're very grateful to Lars Lippner and Carol Davis of Solent University for their stimulating and thoughtful report. Many of you will know Lars, uh, head of Warsash Maritime School. Carol's associate professor, uh, whose expertise is in teaching and learning, now on secondment to the MCA as assistant director for modernising maritime education, which is particularly pertinent. Uh, their report's now published and on the Commission's website. Uh, and incidentally, if you downloaded it at the moment that it was published, uh, there's a refreshed and improved version, um, tidied up, tidying one or two errors, which is now available. Uh, so if you did get it a couple of days ago, you might want to go back and download it again. Uh, and we'll, we'll hear from Carol and Lars in a minute, uh, introducing their report. You see, Chris has just put the link again. In the nature of the subject, this report cannot be definitive and the authors are careful to set out the, the limitations of what they've done. But we hope that education and, and training providers of all shapes and sizes will be able to read the report uh, with their own circumstances in mind uh, and see the relevance. Um, there's particularly pertinent sections on, uh, on when digital learning is less obviously appropriate and on the work still to be done to help learners to make the most of the opportunity and indeed teachers and trainers. Uh, Lars and Carol talk about creating the conditions for productive dialogue uh, and they've certainly done that and that's of course is the whole point of this session. We've got four other speakers and I'll introduce them briefly, complementing and supplementing what the report says and then we've got half an hour for comment and discussion. We asked Solent to do a rapid review, and in the nature of a rapid review, it can't be all embracing. Uh, we're also, as a commission, as Graham said, keen to respect our remit, which covers the whole of the maritime sector. So we'll hear from Cathy Woolwork of Versac, uh, who sells online courses to the sector worldwide from their base in Manchester. And from Matt Gilbert of the Institute of Chartered Shipbrokers, offering the perspective of a professional body, running courses and exams worldwide for their members. And then we've got two quite different speakers. Um, so let make a point in the report uh, about the importance of professional statutory and regulatory bodies, PSRBs, and how important their approval is to changing practice. 
the report talks about those bodies providing a flexible and realistic framework for providers and we'll hear two of them hear from two of them first Ajit Jacob chief examiner for the Maritime and Coast Guard Agency uh, the MCA reacted very fast a year ago permitting new flexibilities so the show could go on uh, Ajit's going to reflect on that experience and what it means for the MCA in the future and everyone else who relies on the MCA and then we'll hear from Graham Clark of the SQA, the Scottish Qualifications Authority. An important strand in the report is that working digitally isn't just about what learning takes place, it's also about the changed nature of assessment. In Solent's survey of other providers, two thirds of them said that they'd changed the way they approach assessment. Graham's head of service for digital assessment for SQA, uh, so his expertise lies in assessment rather than particularly in the maritime sector and Graham will offer us his reflections on the report. So that's quite a body of expertise and I hope we'll have a stimulating two hours. Uh, we're really grateful to all our speakers for making the time. And then we'll throw it open. Uh, Graham will chair a discussion for half an hour or so. And then first, um, over to you, Lars and Carol. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, Howell, let me give me a second to load the slides and uh, Whilst they do so, I just want to welcome everyone. Um, and we're going to co present. It's going to be um, presented between uh, Dr. Carl Davis and myself. Um, um, let me just go to the preview. Could I just get a thumbs up that this can be seen please yep lovely thank you very much and with that carol i'm handing over to you Lars, we seem to have lost Carol for a second. Are you happy to, to start and then Carol will rejoin as soon as possible? I, I can do this, absolutely. Okay, um, that's fine. So as, as mentioned earlier in uh, about uh, November time last year, October, November time, um, we've uh, submitted a bit to the Maritime Skills Commission for this piece of work which uh, was written at the very short notice so it was 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 submitted to the skills commission uh, somewhere around um somewhere around january and uh, the, the the finalized version as was mentioned earlier by by ian can be downloaded on the link that you will find on the chat this is not uh, i'm not going to talk too much about uh, uh carol or myself uh, I do want to highlight, though, that Carol is, is, is an educator, education expert through and through, uh, and uh, an associate professor in uh, uh, learning and teaching, currently on secondment at the MCA. Uh, I myself, I head up at the Warsaw Maritime School as its director. Right, so what was the aim of the work that we set out? There was two main aims to it. First of all, it was to capture the lessons that we've all learned in these quite tumultuous and very challenging uh, last 12 months. Um, I'm very grateful for the Commission to have had the foresight of uh, asking the question in first place. Um, it's, it's crucial to keep, a, keep, keep a, uh, the, the overview and, 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 and capture those lessons. Um, whilst the topic is hot. Um, so I think that was a very good call. Um, and of course, secondly, it's about ensuring um, that we turn these challenges into something that creates a long-term benefit and a value add um, to, to, to the industry. And I hope that 
our report would have contributed towards this. Um, I think Carol is, is, is back. So actually, Carol, that might be a good point now to just hand over to you and I've done the introductions for you. Yes, thank you very much, Lars. And before um, you, Graham and Ian, apologies. I was very dramatically removed from um, the, the webinar, but I'm now back in. And Lars, may I ask you to go back a slide, please? Um, and I'll just add um, to that. So um, as Lars has already stated, um, the aim was to capture the lessons. Um, you know, learned as part of the response to the pan pandemic. And Lars will talk in more detail about how we gathered the data, also when and where from. And I think it's really important to note that we included a number of maritime courses, both seafarers, shore-based uh, maritime business of varying lengths from one week to three years, those carrying PSRB certification and accreditation from cadetships to undergraduates and CPD. And central to this endeavor was a desire and commitment to share findings in all areas. Also share best practice, what needs more discussion, understanding and resourcing. And how um, providers industry and um, PSRBs um, can engage in go go going, going forwards. And you know, there appeared to be a number of principles which led to effective learning delivery and outcomes. And this report is very much looking at how we better integrate digital learning and assessment into maritime education and training. Lars, next slide, please. Thank you. And it's important to look at de definitions. And I think we had no intention of ignoring some excellent work that had been done in maritime education around online courses, around the digital, including simulation um, and augmented reality. But I, I think just that, you know, taking a moment to think about what digital learning means and this emphasis on technology, but also the effective use of it and how it is complex, it encompasses a very wide spectrum of practices. And this amalgamation of online learning and blended learning, which can you know, be, be both friend, friend and foe. And we will talk more about this later. Um, but encourage you very much to read the report because we go into this, particularly the um, definitions in much more detail. And we recognize that digital learning, online learning and blended le learning is both situational and, and contextualized. Lars, I'll hand over to you now. Thank you, Carol. Um, just a brief uh, overview on, on, on the data that was used as the basis for the report. There's uh, fundamentally two sets of data. First of it was drawing from own data within uh, Solent University and, and, and we did benefit here from the fact that we are offering a very wide range of courses to the maritime sector, both on the sea-based, uh, to, to, to seafaring side, as well as for the shore uh, base side of the maritime industry and anything from professional shore courses uh, to uh, uh, academic programs at, uh, at, at level three right up to, to, to level eight. Um, we divided uh, the data that we reviewed into three phases and basically looked at the phase uh, before COVID hit and before we all learned what this terrible term lockdown means in reality. Um, and it's worthwhile mentioning that we, we doubled before there all, then already in uh, quite extensively in, in digital learning, but maybe not to that full extent as we were forced to do in phase two. And phase two really describes the rapid pivot uh, to digital. So you remember pretty much uh, nearly to the day a year ago is when we were all forced into the first national lockdown and it wasn't just Solent University of course uh, 
many, many other providers across the UK equally uh, adapted pretty much overnight to uh, deliver via digital means and to keep maritime education and training to the entire sector going. Um, in, in, in our case, that, that rapid pivot uh, was then uh, followed by a phase of reflection and, and, and a phase of revision. So we went back to the drawing board and extensively with, a, uh, with taking the learnings into account from, from phase two, uh, then further increased uh, what we had to offer and, and, and further looked at the course design and our resources uh, taking into account everything we learned. So really interesting to, to then look at the outcomes of these three three different phases and, 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 and what we looked uh, uh, at was hundreds and hundreds of data sets, uh, anything from uh, student satisfaction over assessment results, progression results, in module surveys, uh, in feedback sessions with, 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 with staff and students and, and, and extracted as much uh, from it as we could. Really crucial though, is uh, of course the second set as well. Um, so the second set of data uh, comes from a questionnaire that was distributed uh, or sent out to various uh, education and training providers in the sector. And uh, the, 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 the organizations who filled it in together educate about 17,000 learners a year employ about 550 uh, lecturers uh, in various guises. You see there's a very wide range of PCRBs that are covered as well, in case someone does wonder on this, this webinar what, why we are always referring to PSCRB, it's the professional statutory regulatory body such as the MCA or the other ones that you can see on here. Um, these providers again cover a very wide range of courses, both academic courses uh, from level three uh, onwards, and again, a lot of specific maritime uh, professional courses. So a very wide range of, of data. In an ideal world, we would have had time uh, to, to, to extend the period of this questionnaire and go much wider. Uh, probably didn't quite help that it was just before Christmas and uh, I don't know about you, Christmas was slightly different this year and certainly an incredibly hectic time uh, for everyone. Moving on, um, some of the key findings. Um, I think it's, it's, it's as, as both Graham and, 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 and Ian already uh, mentioned earlier, uh, it's quite impressive how the sector as a whole managed to respond to the challenge. And I think a lot of people that would have been uh, maybe more skeptical uh, in, in the past, um, maybe less so, and, 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 and to, to some extent, uh, we all were forced to demonstrate that uh, digital learning really can work and can enrich uh, what is on offer uh, to, uh, to the sector in terms of maritime education and, uh, and training. Not without challenges and really crucial to discuss further what are the what is the environment that needs to be in, in place for this to be fully effective and efficient. For me, one of the key takeaways really is that we need to accept that digital learning is absolutely manifestly different to a classroom setting and the pedagogies that are uh, related to face-to-face in-person learning. Digital learning is different and must follow, from my point of view, the pedagogies uh, associated with this particular type of learning. So really, there's something that's come back very strong in the feedback uh, uh, throughout, which if, you, if, you, if you're just trying to replicate one-to-one uh, -one what you're doing in the classroom and just rather than speak to a class, speak to a camera as I do right now, um, that might not necessarily be the most efficient way. 
so we are talking about um, we are talking about course redesign rather than course replication in a digital uh, context. Course redesign itself, of course, does require potentially the upskilling of teachers and and learners, uh, and and also the implementation of new digital tools into the tool set that we use to 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 teach. Um, the upskilling of of teachers, I'm sure, is something that many of my colleagues, who no doubt are attending this call uh, and and uh, would, would would recognize. Um, is a challenge because you will find that uh, in, in, in most uh, uh, bodies of, 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 of teachers there will be varying varying levels of digital literacy as by the way there will be amongst your learners. Another thing that's really crucial for um, uh, digital learning is, is, is the necessity to create a baseline across the program, if a program consists of various modules, uh, to create the consistent baseline. So the learner in the digital environment uh, intuitively finds themselves in the, at home and finds, find, finds things with ease. So, so one thing, and that's particularly, it's surely a learning from, from that rapid pivot where everyone pretty much on, on a very granular basis try to just do their at the best to, to deliver online. Um, maybe some of that consistency would have got lost and then that's a really, really key, key aspect for, for, for a successful uh, learning journey. We also need to realize and bear in mind that Peer-to-peer -peer learning and collaborative learning uh, is widely acknowledged to be amongst the most effective ways of learning. Yet, this is much more difficult to achieve in a, in, in a digital setting. I would really encourage everyone to, to, to reflect on that when, when, when designing uh, programs for digital learning. Um, it would be, be an incredible shame to uh, not make the most of peer-to-peer -peer, uh, uh, learning activities. But that needs to be fa facilitated, that needs to be enabled, needs to be built in uh, to, the, to the program. Peer-to-peer -peer learning is also really important from my point of view uh, as a part of, of social interaction um, and, 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 and engagement and, and will also uh, help the fact or alleviate potentially some, some of the increased mental health pressures that potentially come with increased isolation uh, around digital learning. Finally, <clears throat> it's really a time for us to take a step back and reflect. It's a time to, to, for us to, stay, to reflect on um, how do we want to deliver things? Do we want to deliver uh, tuition in, in, in synchronous ways, so live, do we want to uh, deliver tuition asynchronous, pre-recorded differently? And actually very often you probably find um, that, that the mix thereof can be incredibly effective. Um, Carol, I'm going to hand over in a minute and Carol will, 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 will talk about some of the recommendations that we are making in, in, in that report. But just as a final thought for me, I think if, if, if I reflect on, on, on as, as the director of the school, I'm, I'm very much looking forward. I'm looking forward to seeing more students coming back on campus. We've, we've got, we had students back on campus since, since, since last June, really, for the practical courses. I'm seeing, seeing, seeing looking forward to, the, to more of them coming back for, for more of the academic courses as well. Um, I think if, if, if speaking from a personal capacity, if, the, if lockdown has taught us anything, is how, it, it is how invaluable um, that human contact and social interaction is. So my view as a director of an education institution is that actually when, when we get our students back into the classroom, I wanna treat that as 
one of our most valuable assets, one of our most valuable time. Let's make sure we spend this time for the best possible reason. And that's, that's going back to that point seven here. So let's, let's think about um, how we maybe can free up some of the more old school boring ways of delivering to have much more meaningful uh, in-person activity that is not, no, not only a more enjoyable uh, uh, learning environment for students, but crucially achieves uh, much better learning outcomes. And with that, I'm going to hand over back to Carol. Thank you. Th thank you, Lars. Um, we have a series of rec recommendations and I'm, I'm re reading a comment in, in the chat, which is asking um, whether the focus of the report was intended to be on institutional academic providers. Um, and whereas we drew on a, a, our data fr from Solent University, we also included as detailed in the report, six other Tra training providers and the intention was to kind of open up the debate, look at recommendations which regardless of context and situation were about effective practice, best practice and it was to think about how those lessons learned could be applied more widely or whether actually we needed to go above and beyond. But certainly the recommendations for providers we saw it as essential. These were the themes that, that emerged fr fr from the data and uh, our, our, our work, um, that there was a need to upskill support staff in creating content um, and applying the pedagogies of digital learning, which are distinct from classroom teaching, which Lars has always touched upon. And this is you know, a, a, a fundamental aspect that it takes much longer to create content for online on online learning and it's not a question also of, of taking the content and putting it on online you know there's a particular design and approach re required using evidence from the last 12 months i think was really important to challenge the notion of how i've always done things and to do that from a standing start was quite extraordinary and as we've touched upon challenging and tiring but it has enabled us to have a debate about how do we move forward in maritime education across the whole industry as well Acknowledging the issues of digital poverty amongst learners, such as lack of equipment, poor connectivity, and a lack of suitable study space at home, became more evident. And, you know, I, I think that we can also conclude that for our teachers as well, you know, similarly, they didn't always have a suitable space to broadcast on. They didn't always have the, the equipment that would enable them perhaps to teach most effectively. So there's certainly a need to look at that in quite a critical way. And whether it's buying students laptops on, and letting them have them on loan, or whether there's actually some other things that we might implement. And we talked to that in the report. The impact of isolation and screen time on students and staff's mental well-being is documented in the report. And this is something that um, cannot, um, you know, be, 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 be ignored. And creating activities that require social interactions it, it, is critical. It's relational aspects and how you can provide something online whereby learners feel they are part part of a community whether that's a, a one day course a one week course a six month or a free free year course and recognizing that learners vary widely um, when designing and i'm seeing a comment coming up in the chat about the need for kind of re redesigning and reconfiguring and thinking differently about on online um, content and it's not always um, the prior experience is not necessarily always related to age. It can be about price schooling, cultural background. And um, all right, I think there's another slide com coming up, Lars. Thank you. Thank you, Carol. Um, 
we've also put some recommendations in there for, for, for PSCRBs. Um, is really crucial. The, the PSCRBs have got a really important role to play because uh, you need to be we create an environment in which uh, uh, this this education can be progressed. Okay, so it's really crucial that uh, PSCRBs and education providers, uh, private and public ones, small and big, uh, 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 work along with experts to create a new approval framework for the implementation of new maritime digital learning forms. Again, just highlighting um, the, the, the pedagogies are really quite different, they're manifestly different from, cl uh, from the classroom teaching. And therefore, it would be wrong uh, in itself to uh, insist uh, for approval purposes that the online version is a replica of the classroom course so that is really something that i would would really strongly emphasize uh with 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 PSCOBs. He, he he's got to be he's got to be something different to make the most use of use of it i'm very much looking forward to uh hearing graham's bit at the end of this uh this these presentations because clearly there are challenges uh, uh around academic integrity uh it's really crucial that we also uh, talk where, where there is where there is assessments um, as part of a program or a course. It's really crucial that that chat is had with with students right from the beginning about what is academic uh, misconduct and and creating uh, the right set of environment for academic in integrity, including technical solutions. One day, I would hope. Uh, uh, and, 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 and also looking at alternative means of assessment. Um, and Carol, I'm going to let you take the next two slides. Thanks, Lars. So in terms of recommendations for learners, and we um, you know, use learner and student in, in, interchangeably, but it's those who are um, attending courses and programmes of, of study. And certainly we would recommend that learners to be guided and supported in moving from more teacher-centred to more learning-centred approach. And this is particularly critical um, on, on online and it, you know this managing of expectations at the point of enrollment about what's expected but also the support comes in the um, the engaging nature of the content the navigating around the online content um, that the, the signage building in activities which are appropriate um, peer learning opportunities and, and formative assessment and always within that um, aware of the other things um, the the requirements of professional bodies bodies as well and and, and syllabus and expecting and enabling learners to participate as well and feel part of something because when you're online it can be easy to to disappear the move away from monitoring attendance and minimum required attendance hours a move towards more meaningful measures of engagement so we've already talked about part participation demonstrating knowledge in a, in a in a variety of ways not being passive within that and that mindfulness that concentration online it is reduced so the expectations also about what work is done in advance so flipping the classroom as a concept also afterwards after the sessions that balance between asynchronous and, and synchronous recognizing that measures of student engagement is complex and it's not just looking at the number of times students have logged on to site whether they are present, but also what they are doing and part of that dialogue with students and also getting them to evaluate the experience, the learning experience is, 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 is crucial. And again, we refer to that in the report and that, that's certainly part of the dialogue which we seek 
with, with the sector is what have other providers done and what have they, they found helpful and also things like you know how do you manage learners who refuse to put their camera on when they're um, in class or online next slide please Lars we've talked about teachers um, and the challenges faced as well as the opportunities and that exploration about how digital technologies can create an integrated approach to digital learning. We talked about the blended, the blended approach um, and this um, interface between physical classrooms and online spaces and that, you know, readiness for the return to physical classrooms and what's sometimes referred to as hybrid learning and how we complement um, between the two, the two approaches. And, you know, we talk about this continually through, through the report and also in our presentation about how we share best practice across across the sector and new perspectives. And that can be through peer, peer observation. You know, we've talked about the loneliness of teaching online and actually joining others classes and online spaces and having a dialogue about what is being observed and experienced is, ex is extremely fruitful. Lars has mentioned academic integrity and authentic assessment and this um, concept of academic integrity does not apply to only academic um, credit bearing courses, it's, it's also about other pr professional courses and the authenticity of assessment. So my colleague Adja is um, talking talking later about how the, the MCA is working towards online assessment but which still needs to be rigorous and relevant and satisfying that the standards of the, of the profession. We've already touched upon this but I think it's worth repeating about the creation of new digital content for asynchronous learning and breaking content down into smaller chunks in a, in a more appealing way and above all including students as partners and co-creators of the online spaces as well you know we, we've done that um, successfully and we can continue to do it more and do go to the report and look at the quotes from students and, and their experience particularly because for those who kind of have a, had a very positive experience and have enjoyed it there are those who have, have also struggled with this so it's taking the best practice and thinking if we had done things differently would it have been better for them and we have a next slide Carol, i think we've 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 just reached our lot the time i can um, oh okay Preempting Ian to come in, so there is uh, the final slide is the SWOT analysis, and I think we'll use that as an incentive for everyone to download the report because this is exactly the same SWOT analysis is in the report for you to digest. And uh, I, 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 we, we'll stop here. Um, there's a very interesting question there from Paul in the chat. Yes, we did look at e-learning, and I'm very happy. Uh, you know, to look at the and, and e-learning is part of, of of the bigger picture here absolutely and i'm very much looking forward to discussing that further when we get to the questions thanks very much lars thanks carol um, and thanks uh lars for picking up that question we'll, we'll get down to the questions that have been posted both in the q a and in the chat uh, when we get to the uh, discussion section afterwards uh, now, two different sorts of perspectives um, from uh, Cathy and from Matt. Uh, I was thrilled uh, when Maritime UK had its awards uh, um, last autumn that the International Trade Award went to a training company. This is Cathy's company, Vertec. We'll, we'll start with a word or two from Cathy about what her company's doing and then hear from Matt from the Institute of Chartered Shipbuilders. Over to you, Cathy. Thank you. Uh, yes, uh, I'm Cathy from Versec and uh, Versec provide blended and online accredited and bespoke tra security training into several sectors with a current focus on maritime. Our stakeholders have operated and trained in maritime security for nearly 30 years. 
we're a sponsor members as well for Mersey Maritime, which is a maritime cluster based here in the Northwest. And we're also partners of the exciting new maritime digital hub based in Birkenhead. So there's lots of exciting new things coming out from that. Um, and yeah, it's relevant to point at this point that pre-COVID, the demand for digitalization of training had already gained significant traction as mentioned previously. And we identified that once the pandemic arrived, there was an exponential growth in the demand for online training in many sectors, including maritime. Originally, we developed, developed our training in a classroom environment. And so some of our delegates were traveling from all over the world, which prompted the question, would the training be preferable if it was available as an online solution? So we conducted our own market research at the time to evaluate the appetite for taking training online and the feedback was unanimously in favour of digitalising it. And so this led to the formation of Versec. We've worked really hard to gain approval by the awarding bodies to take our training fully online. And we're passionate about delivering innovative online training to the very highest standard. We work alongside the MCA with having some of our courses approved by them. And we're very proud to advocate British training into the international community. And feedback from our clients has been excellent. E-learning, as you're all probably aware, are highly versatile and it centres on the individual learner. The learner can review material in depth, reflect on it, revise it and repeat it until they're happy with what they've taken in. So this allows for the absorption of complex material and for retaining con content effectively. Uh, research clearly demonstrates also that e-learning retention rates are sometimes much higher than classroom delivered training. And the other obvious benefits of uh, online training and e-learning is reduced travel, uh, reduced training costs due to not having to travel, reducing carbon footprint and assisting with the decarbonisation agenda is flexible and convenient so that rather than having to organise people into a classroom to deliver face to face training, E-learning can fit it in with people's own schedules, which allows for a rapid but adaptable accumulation of knowledge. E-learning is consistent in its delivery, where in a classroom environment, a trainer may have both good and bad days when teaching. And the point of e-learning is that it is iterative, incremental, and meets with individual requirements. So no one finds themselves in a classroom situation where they might feel left behind or too advanced. And its flexibility means that employers can tailor the training of their staff to fit the demands of ongoing work. It's also worth mentioning here about some of the challenges that we've experienced and one of those, one of our most recent ones being the theft of our IP, where a competitor flagrantly copied not only our courses but also our business model. They gained government level accreditation from Transport Canada using materials and content stolen from our courses and there seems little we can do about this as the company is based in Quebec and our pre-infringement legislation means that we would have to take them through the Canadian courts to pursue this further at huge costs. So this is another area for consideration that has not been mentioned within the report, but is very valid considering the increased interest in digital training. We must also consider that any digital training needs to be of the highest standard. There's excellent digital training out there, but we've also all seen examples of really poor platforms and content that gives e-learning a bad reputation. So we recognise the need for engagement and interaction for learners and maintaining their attention. And we're constantly striving to use innovative ways to do this, looking at ways to make the user experience to be the best it possibly can. We're working with academia to develop a new learning management system to take advantage of new innovations to improve methods of delivery of training, making the learner's journey the most enjoyable, engaging experience possible. So next week, sorry, next month, we're duly presenting to the students of Hull University alongside Maritime UK and supporting them with their outreach and careers programme to raise awareness of employment to the younger generation who might not be fully aware of the job opportunities available. And this younger generation have grown up with technology. And now is the time to accept and embrace digital training's place and allow it to be an upcoming part of the training process. We firmly believe that there is a need for all permutations of training and also acknowledge that COVID has brought about an evolution in the way that training is being accepted and delivered. And because it's been forced on us, 
we're now clearly identifying the advantages of digitalization that have always been there. We know that training will never be the same as it was pre-COVID. And we now need to work collaboratively together to embrace change that comes out of reports such as this one and work together to deliver a consistent and credible end-to-end -end solution and develop standards that providers adhere to. Thank you. Great stuff, Cathy. Thanks very much. Really good uh, uh, private company perspective and, and to hear the awful story about the theft of your intellectual property. Yeah. <laughs> and for a, a different sort of perspective, from moving from a relatively new startup to a venerable chartered institution, if I can put it that way, Matt, um, Matt from Institute of Chartered Shipbrokers. Thank you very much, uh, Ian. First time I've been described as venerable, but I'll take that. Um, thank you. I'd like to thank you for the opportunity to join the panel and the Commission and um, Solon Walsnash for this excellent report, which has really captured all of our experiences, really, and documented it with, uh, with a lot of useful content and recommendations. So I would recommend downloading and, and scrutinizing the report. Um, so the ICS is, uh, is a Royal Charter professional body that is recognized worldwide. Um, we offer programs to people undertaking professional studies in nearly 100 countries worldwide, um, supported through our branch network with about 26 branches and uh, teaching partners, about 20 teaching partners worldwide um, at a number of levels, whether, whether uh, students are studying by a traditional distance learning system or professionals taking, uh, taking a self-study route um, or uh, being lucky enough if you live in you know, a, a geographic cluster that makes it uh, uh, possible like uh, Hong Kong, Singapore, Piraeus, London, um, uh, having the luxury of being able to attend traditional face-to-face -face or classroom training. So our, uh, and these are about 2,000 learners we, we, we are um, registering and supporting on an annual basis. And our, our um, challenges, I think, are similar to many of the challenges we've heard about here. Um, and uh, the, the initial one in March 2020 was really an overnight um, switch of our, our classroom training to a live online uh, synchronous delivery using, using various platforms. And uh, luckily, um, normal service was, was not interrupted there, but it did involve quite a bit of onboarding of our tutors. We have a sessional business model, so we don't directly employ academic staff or tutors we 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 tend to support practitioners from the business who are experts in their subject um, so there was a fair bit of onboarding and uh, training of them as well as uh, supporting all of our global teaching centers and branches in uh, onboarding them in various platforms so that was um our let's say rapid mobilization and our phase two, if you like, was the development and deployment of uh, a learning management system. We licensed uh, Moodle, had that branded, configured, everybody trained, uh, all of the content um, adapted, including acquiring um, an E2 learning suite of content uh, through some very generous donors. Uh, these are school i see there's some questions in the, in the q a about that but if we if we're talking about these sort of autonomous e-learning modules as, as SCORM packages um, and that was done and launched tested and all of the tutors who would help with uh, discussion forums monitoring and uh, live chats etc that was done within five weeks and, and published and it was adopted it was taken up by about 900 international learners who didn't have other uh, resources available to them and the feedback was extremely positive uh, the administration burden was 
very light in terms of user management. Everything was very stable. Uh, in fact, it um, from the sort of younger person, the learner's point of view, um, it created a common space for for all of these sort of usually atomized elements of of learner management. Um, so that was a if you like a, a resource optimization benefit that we hadn't necessarily considered at the outset. It was done with um, existing resources, no new money and very low cost, a lot of effort and man hours and, and volunteer hours went into that. And, and what it did is uh, what some of the other benefits we discovered, um, well, number one, it, it swept aside some of the cultural obstacles that we had experienced as uh, an institute, you know, as an old established institute um, with uh, with a little bit of a culture of uh, well, it's not broke. Uh, it, let's not try and fix something. We've we've done this this way for a number of years. So, um, you know, thank you, pandemic. I, I hate to say that, and, and and I'm sorry that this is being recorded, but actually, there there are some 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 benefits that have. That have come out of this. Um, I hear the the comment about uh, digital poverty, actually, and and that was really one of the cultural obstacles that we had within the institute because we do have a number of learners, branches, teaching centres in the developing world uh, where it is said there is reduced connectivity, unreliable power, in many circumstances, which is all true. Um, but that actually took us by surprise that that was less of an issue in, in that um, these days these platforms um, apps are configured to be able to work offline and people who may not have desktop computers uh, reliable power actually what surprised me was they had um, they were able to access uh, courses and learnings and, and tuition via an inexpensive smartphone, um, even you know, with a with a, a relatively cheap um, data contract. So actually, it, it extended our reach and scale, um, and you know that was a dividend that we hadn't necessarily expected. Um, now, as I mentioned, I think it kind of levels the playing field throughout the generations. So we have a certain generation of tutors and experts, examiners, assessors, um, some of whom are a bit more digital savvy than others. And I, we did spend a good, good deal of time supporting them, inducting them, onboarding them, uh, and, and, and even providing like a, a digital concierge in some live events to troubleshoot problems. Um, and as we've carried this on, and we all know that this is still among us, so we've, we've carried all of these behaviors through to our next academic year, then that burden has just fallen away completely. And, um, and it's not just thanks to us because uh, everybody's been doing all of this in their normal life, communicating with their, you know, nephews and grandchildren and, and all the rest of it and accessing other services and, and learning. So I think there has been a, a general leveling up, but we are still monitoring this idea about digital poverty. Um, and Importantly, we're not replacing any of the support elements that were there previously. So it's adding accessibility. It's not replacing anything with a more scalable, um, you know, more uh, profitable sort of motive, if you like. Um, yeah, so we see it now really as a key part of our learning and content story going forward. Um, you know, I take Lars's point about the massive learning party we're all going to have uh, when all this is safely behind us and we can have human content contact again. Whether that's in the workplace, the office, the classroom, um, you know, we're not uh, we're not going to eradicate that. And, and I think there are there will always be. Uh, a huge amount of benefits to gain from that. Um, but we will use that in a different way, in much the same way that I think office life 
won't necessarily return to normal. It won't be about coming to a, a workstation with a, a desktop and a filing cabinet and a, and a franking machine. It'll, about, it'll be about, you know, what are the reasons for us to get together as a team to have high quality meeting spaces to be able to collaborate. So I think learning um, in the classroom will be a little bit like that too, in that some of the pre-reading, the, the underpinning theory, the, the conceptual stuff, the stuff that you know can work well online um, can be div delivered in a sort of integrated blended approach. Um, finally, I, I think I hear there were some questions in, in the, in the Q&A about um, about professional bodies and their, their attitudes to mandatory classroom hours and all of that jazz. Well, we don't, we, we're completely agnostic about all of that. Our assessment um, approach doesn't mandate, it's not based on uh, a credit hour delivery of, uh, of FaceTime. It is traditional old school uh, written examinations, um, closed book. We are looking at our uh, assessment system um, to look how that can possibly work within a digital environment. Uh, that is a bigger work stream and the, and the critical consideration there is not necessarily the technology, which I think is there in various guises uh, according to different operational models, but it's about um, maintaining standards, integrity, and, and the public trust that is so vital uh, behind the scene, behind the, you know, behind the system. Um, one of the other challenges, just to sign off, and then it's been mentioned by others, in terms of redesigning programs for, for a digital environment. Um, and that is, that is absolutely true. There are some things which, don't necessarily work in a like for like replacement. You wouldn't want to murder anybody online for a three day intensive masterclass. Um, you would take the opportunity to uh, deliver that sequentially, serialized over a period in shorter, more intense, more focused chunks with perhaps some other asynchronous um, autonomous assets. In between but when you're already doing the other stuff too um, it just makes that uh, you know you can't necessarily add that element as part of the blend if you like so that's a bit disappointing the platforms themselves um, are okay some of the older more established ones which are bigger in the marketplace are a little bit clunky and, and starting to look a bit like they're past their sell by date. Um, I'm talking about synchronous conferencing software. Um, yeah, so I think it's very good to keep these things under review um, and keep the dialogue going. This is a very good forum, the MSC uh, and, and Ian, if you are the digital czar, uh, digital learning coordinator on behalf of the committee. But um, yeah, very pleased to be a respondent in the survey and to be invited to share uh, our experiences with you today. Thank you. Great. Thanks, Matt. Master of Ceremonies, certainly not czar. Um, just and moving things on fairly quickly, if I may, so that we can uh, get the last two direct contributions and then have the discussion. So can I hand over to you, Ajit, please, for the Maritime and Coast Guard Agency. Thanks, Ian. Uh, thanks for giving us the opportunity to speak. And um, thanks to Graham for enabling this uh, and uh, to Caroline Lass for producing such a comprehensive report. So um, uh, among other things, COVID uh, circumstances because of COVID potentially presented one of the greatest threats to um, global education. So from the maritime perspective, really, we did not have a choice. The global supply chain had to be maintained, regardless of the restrictions placed by some ports, the ships needed to sail. 
So ships uh, need qualified and certified seafarers. That became a challenge. Um, I really felt sorry, especially for cadets who uh, have joined and embarked on a maritime career, thinking that they'll achieve a competency only to see their hopes sort of dashed just because the courses were not available and the assessments were not happening. It was just not fair. So, uh, so the question is, had these changes, the uh, drive to digitalization been made only because of COVID? Uh, we had our internal business plan in 2019. There were proposals to change uh, on modernize the, the training and certification regime. But what has certainly happened in the last 12 months and because of COVID is that the that wheels of modernization has, has gained the much needed impetus. And, and I would say commitment from nearly all, all of the stakeholders. So when we uh, entered the first lockdown, uh, the perception was uh, maybe four weeks, six weeks, it should be all fine. And uh, we had our contingency plans for business continuity in place, work from home, we had laptops, uh, but we still needed to issue the mandatory certification for seafarers. So we came up with digital uh, certificates, COCs, gave extensions, um, and which could be done in a digital manner. So uh, what was important to us was, was that the seafarers continue their education, training, and take their assessments. So um, we published MIN 611, which was um, really this time last year, within one week of the lockdown, which, which presented uh, alternative ways uh, of uh, them getting certified, uh, extension to certificates, uh, extensions to um, vessel certificates as well, which was another MIN and so on and so forth. So since then, obviously we had come up with a couple of other amendments um, as we learned about the different ways uh, um, that were available uh, for, for imparting training and uh, assessments being, being done. So what 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 would we do so if you uh, if you look at the education uh, seafarer training sector um, uh, it, it comprises the long courses the stcw safety courses and then the the assessment so um, i mean we gave the uh, pathway to actually uh, a flexible way in a flexible manner so that the training providers colleges universities could deliver the the courses in the way that uh, would be most useful for the candidate uh, remotely. Um, when I say remotely, now I know more because I've read one through the report, synchronous and uh, asynchronous learning. So most uh, went for synchronous learning, but there were some who actually opted for, for the, uh, um, the, the asynchronous approach. Uh, so that was the key and, and we um, enabled that to happen uh, and, and gave approval for a, for a specific time period because it was done in, in, in quick time. So then we had the assessment side of things to be done. Um, so oral exams are, 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 are required for the uh, candidate to gain a COC. And there was no way that face-to-face -face could be done with the travel restrictions. Um, uh, so we had to come up with alternative ways of doing that. So within two months, we had a, a digital platform which could host the questions in a digital manner. And uh, the examiner surveyors could examine a candidate or do the oral exams uh, or using a remote platform. So, um, and uh, within a couple of months, we, we started uh, doing both engineering and the nautical oral exam. Again, um, STCW short courses, uh, which involves practical uh, elements, and uh, that was a challenge. So uh, again, what we did is any aspect which could be done online, we enabled that to be presented to us uh, by the training providers so that they could do it um, using an uh, online or remote platform. Obviously, practicals, there was no choice, be it lifeboat, firefighting courses that had to be done uh, in a practical scenario. but uh, we enable the courses to be split such that the practical could be done, um, you know, within a certain time period, which would have then, um, uh, you know, minimized the contact um, for, for for contact issues. So, um, uh, in fact, the first online or remote course was delivered first week of April, which is actually quite 
quick which if you think about the lockdown that happened and uh, you know it was um, and, and it was hell more i remember that so um for surveyors we gave specific uh, advisory note for online approval uh, how to do it remotely the stcw convention is flexible it doesn't it say it talks about the administration oversight it says it has to be evaluated the administration has to evaluate the courses so whatever could be done remotely uh, we are doing remotely now the courses which were not running we are we are giving um, extensions based on um, uh, questionnaires so so that the uh, training providers could benefit so those are the things that we did um, over the last 12 months but in terms of regulations uh, what is changing so uh, the we are amending the uh, msns the amendment to the 2015 si which it, it it actually gives flexibility to the colleges universities training providers to present to us different method methodologies for uh, imparting the competencies so uh, which could involve in, include the simulator training and any other alternate uh, ways of delivery of courses so for um a prime example is we've, we, we, we've started the Officer of Watch 500 uh, and, and Master 500 near coastal route. And the idea is just not to just change certain parts of the syllabus. It's to have a whole new thinking about how the uh, training, what all, think, what all uh, competency need to be delivered, how much time need to be uh, devoted to each topic, how best to uh, impart that to the, to the seafarer. It includes the sea time aspects as well, not the traditional training record book, but electronic uh, training record book, which which in, which could include enhanced uh, methodologies for for the seafarer to actually gain that uh, competency. Um, the the blended ways of imparting the training and the new methodology for assessment. So so we made a start, uh, and obviously. As a regulator, we would not be able to do it on our own. We expect that stakeholder engagement from the from companies and uh, from uh, from the training providers and colleges, so that we come up with a robust product. And I would say simulators are, will are a key part of it because I think my view is they are underutilized, so they can be better utilized. So uh, it will be a gradual process, but uh, uh, but I think the end goal is to for us is to have to see that we we have those highly competent seafarers and who can transition ashore if they wish and or, or seamlessly to other areas and uh, they contribute to the growth of a maritime um, uh, growth of maritime uk thank you great thanks very much ajit we uh john wyborn's going to burst if he doesn't we don't get around to questions soon but first we we must hear from graham very keen to hear what you've got to say about assessment and i've introduced you graham as not an expert in maritime but very much an expert in assessment so interested in your reflections on the report over to you yeah that's that's great and what i'll do is i'll share my screen is that okay i'll just we'll see how we get on with that will we um so that should be okay so hopefully you should be able to see the screen at the moment is that right excellent brilliant good um anyway thank you for that and it's been really interesting being in a, a discussion about a sector that i i'm not necessarily know about apart from being in some ferries in my time um but one of the interesting things i guess is that having read the report a number of times i think that the reality is that the common themes are actually common across many areas in education uh, not just in in scotland or the uk but actually more globally as well and i think my reflections are based not just from assessment, though, I guess, and I'm not really speaking for SQA either. Uh, just for information, SQA Awarding uh, is Scotland's national awarding organisation and self-regulate, so we regulate our own qualifications. Um, but we also have SQA Accreditation, which regulates all other qualifications that come into Scotland. Um, and I guess from my perspective, after many years of being involved in teaching, learning, development, delivery uh, and assessment, uh, I'm now in the role that I am. So I guess my quick reflections, as I said, to give time for Q&A, are really just on some hopefully complementary points picking up that will don't overlap with um, some other people's uh, points from the, from the session so far. Um, a few points of reflection, and I say a few because actually after reading the report, there's a lot, and I'm sure we could all have two hours each to talk about all of our reflections, but I just want to pick up on some. 
Uh, and I guess one of them is that having been involved in digital learning and assessment for, as Ian says, nearly 20 years, the reality is that people always had barriers and there was always problems, but fundamentally the biggest one was always cultural. Uh, and actually what COVID and the whole pandemic's done is shake the cultural things away. And some of those things that were deliverable and always have been deliverable are now becoming a necessity. And I think the challenge is that actually the fundamental thing that was always a problem was that we replaced. If you look at one of the challenges, it was always the time was we have cultural things that we believe are important, that exams are the important way of doing stuff. We believe that written, writing thousands of words for a time is the most and most valuable way of evidencing what people know. And actually, it's easier then to think about technology that does exactly the same thing, but just does it at home. And, and therefore people do that. But what it doesn't really do, I guess, my reflection is, and what some of the areas have done this year, is not just challenge how things are done, but what things are done. And when we come to look at assessment, there has to be that balance of the things that assessment, but an opportunity for us to relook and say, is this assessment that we do, is it really evidencing the kinds of things we want to evidence in the learner? to make them suitable in the workplace, to make them highly skilled, experienced, work with colleagues, be an effective citizen and a maritime expert in whatever field it is that they want to work in. I think the second thing in this is one of the points that's always been an issue is assumption of digital learner skills. The reality is, and much of the research shows that every person has a phone, but if you look at their effective digital skills to use it in a work or learning place, they're not the same as using their phone, and they're not the same as using the laptop they may have, and many learners don't know what a laptop is. If they can't pick it up and use their thumbs, they're really gonna struggle with it. So there's a big issue, issue, issue about assumption about young digital learner skills. And what I think's become clear this year nationally is that's come to the fore, actually. It's come to the fore, and as somebody else was saying, there's a leveler, but I think it's a leveler in a different way. So that kind of engagement of that is really important. I think the other thing I took from the report, I guess, is that um, learning, digital learning has been around for 30 years. And in fact, there's an issue about whether it's digital or whether it's remote to whether it's remote and digital. Uh, and OU has been doing this for decades in the BBC Two programmes. Um, and you could argue that was remote. Uh, it wasn't very digital, but it was remote. And part of that is that's fine from that learning. But I guess from my perspective, an awarding body, our priority is assessment. But we also expect assessment to link to learning, not just in terms of content and approach, but in terms of medium and in terms of experience. The idea that someone would do something completely different in learning and then be asked to jump ship, that's an appropriate analogy, I guess, jump ship to a different thing to do assessment, has always been the case, actually. And in many ways, somebody talked about poor learning digital experiences. For hundreds of years, people have experienced really poor non-digital learning experiences in much of their delivery and assessment. And I think it's not to say that it's acceptable, but I think we need to start to challenge and use technology as a way to help challenge what we do and what we assess in some of those areas. And I think the other one of the other things I took from the report, I guess, and from some of the contributors was the fact that the opportunities are real. They're not just here. You know, you hear about, for example, people say, isn't it great? We'll get back to normality. We get back to the pub. We can do whatever it is you want to do. But the reality is that actually everybody's normal is a bit different. And many people don't want to go back to normal. And even forget about digital, they just don't want to go back to normal because they want a new normal. And I think this for me is an opportunity for digital transformation that to be honest, hasn't come around in decades. And um, having, having tried to persuade people for 20 years to do it, all it, I was going to say all it took was a pandemic. All it took was a global crisis. Now, you don't want to have one of those every 10 years, but it's really challenged things and moved in a way that this opportunity is real. And I think one of the things that came from that is I think one of the things that comes through that people see this is not a temporal situation, but a permanent opportunity to move forward and make a difference. I guess a few priorities, and again, uh, there was enough priorities in the report, and, and obviously people here have talked about things, but I guess, um, three that I would pick out from myself, and I think, are, well, there's lots I pick out, but I put some because there's millions of them. Um, when I look at the assessment, I think there's key things about assessment. We need to be looking at improving, not maintaining. Very often, our default assumption, I speak as an awarding body, our default assumption is everything we do now is the gold standard. 
It is the best we can do because we've done that. And if we ever threatened or undermined what we did in the past, the world would collapse around our ears. But the reality is, why would you do anything different if you're not looking to improve it? So when we come to assessment in the same way for learning, we need to be thinking about how does this improve for the learner, the effectiveness of this outcome? How is this a better way to assess what the learner needs to be assessed on so that we can say this person is, knows all the things and demonstrates all the skills and knowledge we need them to demonstrate when they go out and have to work and function in their work environment. So I think always focusing on that enhancement agenda is really important going forward because it is, to be honest, it's easy to convert on the, on the surface and it's easy to maintain. We just move from one to the other, but you still get people to do exactly the same things. They're just doing it in their living rooms and bedrooms with their pajamas on. I guess the second thing is we need to be looking, and I think part of this is one of the things that the maritime skills is so broad. You've got people on land, you've got people in sea, you've got people doing all lots of different things from all lots of different walks of life. And actually as a system, and think about that as a system, it's difficult to move forward as one. And generally the system is always more conservative than elements of the system. And I think one of my reflections and priorities is we need to be encouraging and promoting scalable and sustainable innovation and deliverers faster than the system. So looking at what is it we're saying as a Maritime Skills Commission, uh, having not been involved at all in that, but what is the system saying? But actually, how do at the same time do we encourage and look at providers really stretching the bounds to think innovatively, not just about delivery, but about assessment, and innovatively, not just about mechanisms, but the nature of assessment that really further adapts and responds to the kinds of skills and type of workers that we actually need functioning in all of our industries and in maritime, uh, no less than that. And I think thirdly is, as someone who works for an organization that's very much part of the system, we're part of government, um, and to be honest, many people around this table probably, they might deny it, but actually they're all part of the, the weave of government um, in some way or other. The reality is that we talk about putting learners first, but actually we put the system first. We look at learners, but we put the system. Now I know it's not an easy win thing here as someone involved in that. But actually, I think it's about increasing our focus and saying, for a learner who wants to be involved in a career in a particular area of the maritime sector, what does that look for this? And what do my qualifications, my delivery, my assessment, my learning and teaching, what does that give that helps them further engage in that? And I think that relates, to be honest, about equity and accessibility. I think there's a big issue. It's not about digital. It's actually just generally, I think there's a big equity and accessibility issue beyond just um, the predefined accessibility stuff that we might have. And I think part of that is if we're looking at how do we support learners in the kinds of models that they want and they need to help them progress. Why should, for example, now this isn't about in my time, but more traditionally, why should it take a learner uh, a certain two years to do an A-level? Why should it take them three years to do a degree? Why should it do? Well, only because it's only available for 30 weeks a year. That's why. Well, actually, we need to be thinking about what is it the learner needs? Well, to be honest, if you're doing it in 18 months, um, what's that look like in the maritime skills sector? And I think for me, that's what the technology does. It enables to have those real conversations over models of delivery and model of assessment that really adapt to the needs of the learner, not just now, but going forward, I guess. So, so hopefully that was just a quick um, skip through some of my ideas. Um, I've always got lots more, but um, for those who know me, cutting it down to 10 minutes is always a challenge anyway. Good for you, you succeeded. Thank you very much, Graham. Uh, quite a few challenges in that. Uh, I particularly like we, your challenge to us about improving and not maintaining. Uh, there's a good report that McKinney's has done on virtual work, which I think applies to digital learning just as well, talking about as a muscle, something we can improve with learning and with practice. Yeah. Uh, from from Graham, Graham, over to other Graham, uh, um, for you to manage the discussion. Thank you. Thank you, Ian, and, th and thanks to all colleagues there for your uh, presentations. Uh, very thought provoking, but we'll come to that. And I know people are itching to get on with, uh, with questions. Uh, I think a sensible way of doing this might just be to work through the, the questions that we've got in the order that they came in at the moment. So I'll probably start, if I may, um, 
Although have we, have we uh, is Carol still with us? Sorry, Carol, I can't see on my screen. Yeah, sorry. Yeah, so, I'm here. Gordon Meadows thrown in a question there. What types of e-learning delivery were identified as the most impactful over the instructor-led sessions? Any thoughts? Oh, um, Gordon, that's such a good, good, good question. And um, if we kind of think about the the the, the principles um, of if effective learning. It was um, often about the, the, the variety, um, the guidance, um, you know, the opportunity to switch from activity to activity, but that scaffolding uh, of, of topic appealing to different senses. I've already seen a comment, um, I think it was in the, um, in the questions about how do you appeal to different types of learners? Because you're going beyond the, you know, the, the static um, and you want people to listen and to see and to, um, to, to, to feel, feel something. So it, it would be very much that, that those components um, and also which um, allow people to go at their own pace, but also to check in with, with their progress and have the opportunity then to bring it to a, a, a space which is synchronous and engage with, with, with peers as well. And, and instructors. So I hope that answers your question, Gordon, but I'll be happy to kind of talk offline further about that. Um, and there's quite a lot in the report about be be best practice and we, you know, how we can relate that to e-learning. E Thanks, Carol. Uh, Kathy, do you have any views on that? Still on, Kathy. I think you're still on mute. Sorry, could you just repeat the question? I could, and I will. Uh, yeah, it's just gone into what types of e-learning delivery were identified as the most impactful over instructor-led sessions? Um, we're quite. Um, we don't offer a huge range of uh, online training, and um, our experience in the past where we've. Uh, had uh, classroom training and we've adapted the training to the online and again what's mentioned before be making sure that it wasn't um, a direct um, compa you know comparison because it's a different beast if you like um, I, I, I don't know if that, that that answers the question yeah well I think we've gone a long way to answer it hopefully Gordon we've uh, uh, gone uh, between Carol and, uh, and Kathy answering your question um, but if we moved on to, to John, uh, who has, uh, in a sense, has been active in the questions. I mean, Ajit, you might hope you, you, you addressed this when you, when you spoke, but uh, John is questioning the uh, PSRBs really in, in terms of maritime training, whether they're ready to carry out programme approvals for digital learning, and he questions that. I just want, you, you mentioned you're on a journey with this, and you might want to say a little bit more. Well, thanks, Ram. And, and John, yes, uh, so um, I would say that um, it has to be evidenced. Me speaking here won't uh, uh, give the results, but it's um, the, the new SI, the amended SI, as I said, and the emissions give uh, the pathway uh, and the flexibility for the training providers to present to us the, the, uh, uh, the course content or, or um, you know, the whichever uh, courses uh, you are seeking approval for uh, digital um, online or blended it's for you to propose and then it will be considered so uh, it's not only for the short courses but uh, for the long courses as well to move away from the uh, specific uh, uh, you know uh, time-based um, competency which we uh, right now we have classroom number of hours in the classroom uh, rather to change it to uh, sort of learning outcomes Okay, John, I hope that, uh, that, that gives you a little bit of reassurance uh, in terms of the progress being made there. Uh, you also went on to, to ask about the, the, um, or the challenge of online courses not necessarily being able to address the needs of, of learners in terms of audio kinesthetic learning. Um, and should we establish best practice for this? And I guess, I mean, development of uh, online and digital learning is, is ongoing uh, and I guess the answer is yes we should 
uh, be establishing best practice for this, but I'd be interested in, in panelists' uh, views on this. And I don't know whether, Matt, you have a view from your perspective and, and then Kathy and Carol and, um, and, and other colleagues coming in. So, Matt? Yeah, I think this is, this is tremendously important that you have to consider not just the representational styles, but also uh, different learner styles. So um, it's often difficult to get something like that into a very short course, but part of it is um, making sure that your uh, people who are doing the learning delivery, tutors, lecturers, understand that range of, of tools that are available and the different pedagogies to be able to um, mix up the communication and the resources um, to appeal to a range um, and if you are dealing with a cohort that you get to know over time which is uh, one of the uh, benefits or, or luxuries of uh, you know structured tuition programs offered by colleges and universities then then clearly some sort of formal induction process where you capture uh, particular learning, uh, learning needs um, and enable learners to get a better understanding of, of what they need and what they can get out of the programme. So, yeah, I'd say it's definitely an important consideration when you have a, a larger group um, to create a blend or a range of uh, communications and activities to um appeal to a, ra a range of learning styles and representational uh, styles um is recommended but i think yeah standards and uh, and guidance best practice that is something that where the the skills commission and others can um can really add some value that's a good question thanks Matt. lars did you did you find anything like that and did you pick it up in the report Yes, I, I, I think it's really relevant, and and let, let, let me try and put that in context with, with with what was said earlier by some of the other presenters as well. So, so it was really, really refreshing and interesting to hear, Kathy, uh, your your reflections about the importance of maintaining a standard, which is an important thing to take forward. IP is an issue for everyone, and 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 with Matt, your comparison to. And, and I will get to the point in this. Okay, your comparison to, to, to an office environment and the future of the office environment is really interesting. I was listening to a uh, radio documentary the other day that was looking at the future of office work. And one phrase that stuck with me was the, the office, the, the, the idea of the future could be to be hyper collaborative in the office and hyper efficient at home. Okay. I think we can, to some extent, translate that into an educational setting as well. And, and really going back into that concept of what is, what is synchronous and what is asynchronous. And for me, for me the, the ideas of that time, that time spent synchronous got to be the collaborative time, good collaborative between uh, tutor, lecturer and peers, collaborative between peers and peers. And by the very definition, that will appeal to different learning styles. So that will be the, the enriching bit, whereas the asynchronous thing allows learners to uh, go at their own pace, in their own environment, crucially in a, in a sector that has got a mobile, highly mobile workforce to do it remotely, cut down on that thing. And, and that is also, in some, to some extent, preempting the next question a little bit where the e-learning comes in. So I think the, the, the question that, that the, the, the focus um, seems to be very much around live and pre-recorded lessons is, doesn't, doesn't do it quite justice because it, it's not the idea that synchronous is a live lesson and asynchronous is a pre-recorded lesson. Asynchronous materials is, is different can't conscious be something that you record in exactly the same way that you would do it live. So I think the mixture of these various tools and, and, and using the synchronous bit really for collaboration will be what gives us something 
to finish it off with what Graham said, something that, that, that strives for an improvement rather than a maintaining of the current system. Okay, thank you, Lars. Uh, does anybody have anything to, to add to that? Cathy, do you want to add anything to that? Sorry, yes. Um, yeah, I think that um, as well, there's the, the learning management platforms are really um, moving um, on and becoming more innovative. And so there's um, ways that um, abilities for voiceovers and to have, so you can actually um, choose whether to have audio uh, or not to have audio um, and all sorts of um, interactions that can make the, uh, the online training um, more engaging and, uh, um, and interesting because if, uh, if there's a learner who's uh, doing some training and really enjoying it, then they're going to um, retain the information that little bit more. Thanks, Cathy. Um, so hopefully that, that helps uh, in terms of, of that set of uh, questions. So, so thank you very much for that. Um, Graham, there's a, a question from John that's probably directly related to, to, to your uh, work. Can digital learning really advance until online replacements are found for some of the written exams? And do SQA have any plans for that? And I know it goes broader probably than, than, than just the uh, assessment board, but uh, it'd be interesting to hear what you think about that, Graham. Yeah, that's, uh, thanks for that, Graham and, and John as well. I think uh, you're right. And for many years, much of the digital transference has been about how do we get the same activity, but just online. Um, the reality is it's different to write 2000 words by hand than it is to type 2000 words. And there's been a bit of modification in that in some areas, but fundamentally, culturally, some of those things are a bit harder to crack. And I think this year you will have seen even nationally, not just in Scotland, of how much historically people love exams when they don't exist. Um, so exams are cancelled, but fundamentally how all these parents turn up and say, we loved them, they were great, they were best for our young people. The reality is that, of course, that cultural thing is difficult to get out. And I think from our perspective is, um, no doubt SK will still deliver exams, to be honest, probably. Um, but I think the whole broader issue is about us, not just about technology, it's actually about really addressing some of the more fundamental issues about effective assessment and valid assessment that actually does what it's, we think it does. So we have assessments that are exams, which actually we've always culturally accepted them, they do something, but actually there's some real challenges over, is they, are they the kind of things we need to be doing? So there's no easy answer. I would say that we are working on looking at what alternative models assessment look like um, in very lower key areas, because as you imagine, some of the big ticket ones are more difficult to challenge. But I would say from a Scotland perspective, uh, we have OECD reviewing the Scottish education system at the moment. And out of that, if anybody's seen any OECD impact across the world, um, there will no doubt be significant changes in how we approach qualifications, a learning and assessment going forward. And, and I think for me, it's a further opportunity to re-look again about the role of technology as an enabler to make a positive difference for learners and for the system. And Graham, I guess you've partly answered the question from Gary Highmarsh as well about can 100% of learner knowledge assessments be undertaken using remote online methods? Um, well, the interesting thing, isn't it, about what no, depends what the knowledge is. In the same way that I think, as humans, my own personal belief is we are made to be together somehow, not digitally necessarily, and human contact is a necessity of life, I think. And part of that is in assessment and learning, and is a part of that deal as well. And so therefore, knowledge can be evidenced through in multiple ways, whether digitally, remote, or physically. I'm always struggling, increasingly struggle to evidence how sitting in a hall with a hundred other people is any fit way to evidence knowledge, whether it's on a computer or in paper. I think for me, I wouldn't say that re I think remote um, can have bad remote as well as good remote. And I think from our perspective, it's a model, but it's not the model of assessment. I think for us, it's about having a correct way of doing assessment. I think lots of learners would much rather talk about what they know than actually have to write it. I think other ones should be able to demonstrate what they know rather than have to write about it. So I think for me, it's about the model assessment rather than saying remote isn't suitable. I think remote's as suitable as turn up in person, to be honest. It's about the model assessment. Yeah, yeah, very true, Graham. Yeah, thank you. Very, very much depends, doesn't it? So uh, hopefully that, that's helped. Um, Ian, I'm, I'm going to uh, come to you. Um, uh, we've got a question in that, that 
and others will come in on this, no doubt, about the uh, education system and secondary school learning as well. But I think that probably also relates to uh, work in FE. Uh, will students need to acquire a higher level of qualification at secondary level, uh, in, I assume in IT, uh, for successful integration with IT and learning digitally in higher education? Well, it's an interesting question, isn't it? Um, uh, here we are using some relatively sophisticated technology. Uh, when I was at school, it was only the clever scientists who got to do anything with computers. And somehow I've picked stuff up and I manage okay. Uh, and, um, and I certainly don't have any qualification in doing it. What I've picked up is some understanding and some knowledge and some skill. And I think the same probably applies. I'm not sure that a qualification is the right answer. But certainly the report talks a lot about learners and teachers, tutors, whatever word you want to use, um, understanding how to use these new tools more effectively. And it's the point that somebody made about, um, was it Graham? Um, you've got a phone, but it's got a capability which is far in excess typically of what we were able to do with it. Um, so I, I think there's, there's some work to be done to make sure that people see the opportunities and one of the things that's interesting in the report is the way that uh, uh, Lars and Carol are talking about how people interact with each other. Uh, it's not just a teacher passing over some stuff which people get into their heads somehow but about what people learn from each other um, and I remember I was reflecting as I read some of that asking my son when he was doing his degree, he did his degrees in computer science, um, where he learned. And almost all his learning, he reckoned, was online. Uh, learning from other people, learning how to learn from other people on learning, how to sift all the rubbish from the stuff that was reliable, uh, rather than the traditional classroom where, you know, talking chalk stuff. So, so I think there's probably a range of answers in there. Yeah, thanks Ian. Carol, do you, do you have a view on that? The sort of level of qualification or experience that a student's going to require to be successful using digital or online learning in the HE environment? Yeah, no, I, I, I do have a view. And, um, and Nicola, that's such an in interesting question because it was one I hadn't thought of. But I think, um, you know, it's that joining up, isn't it, between primary school, secondary school, FE, HE um, and you know CPD so it's about how it is purposed and 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 used effectively and you know the integration of, of, of systems but also what it's used for and you know that a lot of IT is utilized um, for so social purposes in young young people so it's also how that there's a pivot for it to be used to learn, but obviously the systems need to be in place and the um, teachers and instructors also need to engage in appropriate ways. So I think, it, you know, it's not so much the um, number of devices you used or the, um, um, the sophistication of the technology, but it's how it links to the learning outcomes, the, the assessment, but also the, the experience. And I think, um, you know, Nicola, thank you. You've given me something to think about, and I really appreciate that. Yeah, it is. It is thought provoking, isn't it, in terms of, uh, of preparation for this type of learning? Um, although for many, uh, you know, delivering it, uh, they probably feel challenged by the the inherent skills that uh, the young people possess as they come through the education system, because they've been more exposed to much of this technology uh, more than we have. But thank you for that, Carol. Um, it really interesting question coming in from, from Gary Hindmarch because um, we hear a lot in the media, don't we, from uh, providers, particularly mainstream uh, education providers, again, universities, FE colleges, schools, etc., and just about the cost of delivering. And uh, it wasn't a cheap option to move delivery online. And uh, Gary asks for the panel to comment on their experiences on the specific investment and operational cost comparison between digital and traditional face to face. I think that's a fascinating one. And I think actually we'll just go across the panel to get to the, 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 the deliverers on the panel to get your views. So, Lars, if I start with you, because you're at the right hand uh, side of my uh, screen. Thank you, Graham. Um... Yeah, again, that's 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 that's. A, a really good but also quite a complex question 
So I think it, we, 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 we need to be careful that we don't uh, oversimplify what a virtual learning environment is, because it's, it's, it's a combination. We've given, given an example in the report, it's, it's very often quite, quite a complex ecosystem of systems that got to work together. Um, so certainly not, not cheap, but I think the other challenge that really comes with it is it changes it changes your staff pattern as well it's, it changes your staff working pattern and 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 the perception that some some learners might have that that oh it's it's all much cheaper to run and less resource intense to run uh certainly hasn't been true for us um i th I, I think you find that um if if you ask staff the the challenge of of having much more uh, one to one versus a one to a too many class communication and being being available to support all that asynchronous teaching uh, much more around the clock uh, certainly puts a lot of resource pressures on not just on the system side but also on the personnel side that would be my main observations yeah thank you Lars Kathy what about from a, um, a, a private provider private sector provider um, yes, having previously uh, provided the training in the classroom environment, taking it online uh, was a completely different experience. Um, even having got the accreditation, it still took a good six months before we could launch any courses. Um, there's a, a huge amount of not just cost, but time involved um, in, in making sure that the, uh, the product is, um, is, is, is as best as it can be. Um, and yeah, so there's a huge amount of work and, uh, and also it's, you know, to think that, oh, we've got something online and, you know, um, it's much going to be, um, you know, easy for us. It, it's, it's, we're always having to invest in, a, in a new innovations, you know, you can't, there's no, there's no room for any complacency. It's so important to make sure that as well, your resource is slight, slightly different, so we um, are very keen on customer support and we talk about the, the learner's um, experience and we want to make sure that we have all the tools available in able to, to support them through the e-learning the, the e experience with us. So, um, yeah, it's, uh, it's very expensive uh, to take it online and um, it's hugely rewarding though. So, yeah, I hope that answers the question. Yeah, I, I, there are going to be swings and roundabouts with all of this, aren't there, and, and uh, pros and cons, but there are considerable benefits and, uh, as you say, fantastic to, to do it. But it, it, there, there are different costs involved in this, aren't there, in terms of the human resource and the, and the, uh, the physical uh, wherewithal to do it. Um, yeah. Matt, is, your, is that your experience? Yeah, I would say um, it, uh, it depends on your budget. and. Um, don't necessarily be put off by um, by the expense, and I, I know in the um, last and in the report, there's a fantastic graphic of the of the Solent system. This kind of, and that's the simplified graphic of what's involved in this sort of constellation of uh, uh, learning management systems, apps, plugins. Um, but you know that Wars Ash and Solent is a, is a major UK university with uh, thousands of learners, and this is a mission critical to the to the whole university if you are a smaller learning provider or a company that uh, and responsible for learning and development there are there are options to to suit your budget um, both in platforms and in content development tools i think the lesson that you know what i what I think about uh, if you're if you're starting out on this journey is don't underestimate the time of of um, of building the content. So that is the, the you have to have a commitment of time, and time obviously equals money if you're using contractors for that. But building the content, um, you know, it's it's not too dissimilar from writing a, a large academic text. It's uh, there's no magic wands to, uh, to, to, to magic this content out of the air. But there are very inexpensive apps, tools, um, platforms for you to be able to license. And in fact, some of them are connected with uh, 
you know, marketplaces that um, that can extend your reach um, to a new cohort of communities of interest. So and that's a little bit of a waffle, but yeah, happy, I happily speak to anybody offline um, who wants to tell me about their problems because the Institute has not had a lot of money swishing around to be able to develop these things. So uh, we've taken a very pragmatic approach and uh, a, a low cost uh, model actually to deliver quite a significant impact. Thanks, Matt. I think, Karen, what we're hearing is that this is neither a cheap nor an easy option to deliver uh, online. Uh, and of course, you've got additional challenges around the differentiation around inclusivity. Uh, and, and I know a lot of uh, effort going in to make sure that, uh, you know, uh, students with uh, certain um, disabilities are still able to access the material appropriately online. What is your experience with that? So is, is that, that's a question for me, Graham. Yeah, yeah, yeah just I'm just yeah. Uh, no, absolutely. So I think I, I would um, um, offer a counter argument. You know, if we state that, um, you know, one of our big e export products um, in maritime education and training is, is this, that actually if we were kind of opening up the market that people don't have to travel to face to face, then I, I, I think there is, you know, real opportunity there. And I think it becomes important when you want to use your, your money pragmatically to take great care in what you are implementing. So to always have a testing amongst user groups, um, you know, of, of, of platforms, but also of, of the content and the e-learning modules. Um, and also really thinking about the things which don't cost money, but actually make such a difference to the learner journey and the learning experience. So how you create online communities amongst peers with your, with, with your learners, because when we kind of looked at what was significant, it wasn't all the, you know, the most fabulous technologies or even the swishiest content. It was how people felt that they felt, you know, there were people rooting for them to do well. There was clear guidance, clear instruction. The content felt relevant um, to their career going forward, but also to their success in the assessments. Um, and there's always a lot of front loading with these systems and initial investment. And I think it is about, um, you know, really treating it as, you know, a project, a project approach. Um, and then the evaluation piece, um, you know, so I'm actually pro it. I think, yes, it you know, can seem initially expensive, but there are different ways of scaling it up, scaling it down, depending on what you're trying to do and your, your, your situation. And I think it's not always the case, the bigger institution, the more resources you have, you may not always be able to have those conversations about what platform um, you, you can use. And I think, you know, you do find that particularly um, with um, vocational courses, that there's not always one size fits all. So, you know, that may be where the smaller training providers have some ad advantage as well. But uh, again, what a, what a great question. Thank you. Thanks, Carol. I think it certainly does come down, doesn't it, to what it is you're, you're trying to achieve and uh, what you're delivering and so forth. And there is going to be considerable uh, difference. So, Ted Miley's uh, just posted in the Q&A that, uh, ocean training, delivering courses worldwide via e-learning, digital learning and blended learning and supplying all courses via a USB stick. Uh, I assume, Ted, though, that the, the material that goes on the stick has been, um, you know, uh, costly in some ways to produce and to, to provide, but, uh, but then very easy to use. And as you say, tutor interaction taking place via email, Skype and Zoom. And it probably does come down, doesn't it, to um, uh, individual courses, individual programmes, uh, type of organization and what you're trying to achieve. Going back to the learning outcomes uh, that Graham was, was, was alluding to, I think the learning outcomes critically driving what it is and that of course informing the assessment and the nature of the assessment. Uh, Colin has just said the conversation assumes that all lecturers are similarly skilled and online courses appeal to all students equally. Surely there's a big piece of work to be done on where each type of system appeals or leverages the strengths and weaknesses of individuals Perhaps this challenge will go away as we build up our experience 
I certainly remember the best lecturers for me. How do we inject passion into the course? Absolutely. I think, I mean, I don't think any of us would disagree, uh, you know, a passionate lecturer, somebody who's engaging that exposure to the expert. Um, that's what brings it alive for us all, isn't it? Uh, and there are many of us in different stages on this journey of delivering. And I think, you know, let's not underestimate the challenge. And one of the things I say about my colleagues in, in the university is they have adapted phenomenally uh, over the course of the, the last 12 months, but they, they're all at different stages and they'll be the first to accept that. And they're all still learning. And of course, uh, we should all operate, I think, in the spirit of continuous improvement and we never get it right. I mean, we should reflect on every session we deliver, whether that be face to face or online, how can we improve it? What could we do differently? What could we make better? And that's a critical part of the process. Colleagues, uh, I'm conscious of time and uh, we could go on, I think, for a long, lot more time. This is one of those topics which just uh, generates debate, discussion. It's fascinating. It's so, so pertinent. If I could just sum up uh, my, my, my thoughts, I think it's been a, a most thought provoking afternoon. Uh, so thank you for everybody uh, to, who engaged with that. I think what we've learned from our, our, our panelists is that, the, the, that, you know, this was happening, but the pandemic accelerated the development of digital learning. Uh, there are obviously places and organizations who are very well established with this, but others needed a nudge and this, this created it. And certainly my own organization's um, uh, experience was we had the infrastructure, clearly the physical infrastructure uh, that allowed, it, allowed us to shift very quickly, but we needed that uh, uh, support, the development of the pedagogy, the materials, and that's ongoing and still indeed needed. Um, uh, for us. And I think, you know, what I'm hearing is that we're, we're only scratching the surface at the moment. There's so much more that we need to do as we begin to further employ uh, digital learning. And, and digital learning is obviously here to stay in its various forms, uh, whatever happens in the future. But uh, there will be purely online courses delivered by a USB stick, but there'll be also this ongoing synchronous, asynchronous delivery that we've heard so much about, um, etc. cetera. I, Take the emphasis on quality. Uh, obviously education and training is all based on quality, isn't it? And it's no different here. We have got to uh, focus on quality uh, as, as much as possible. There's a particular challenge with the professional bodies. I think that's not only in maritime. In fact, uh, it was Graham again who said, look, um, the themes that have been picked up in, in, in this, you know, digital learning in maritime are reflected right across other sectors. And, and I would certainly concur with that. Um, so, uh, was it, it, it yes, the, the, and the other thing that I take away, and I think we all need to, to reflect on, uh, was Graham's point again about uh, how does this make it better for the learner, the enhancement process. Uh, we need to put the learner central, at the centre of everything we do, and we need to focus on what makes it better for them and what makes it easier for them to achieve their, their, their outcomes. Put the learners first, I think is probably the line that I would want to finish on. So thank you for, to Graham. Can I thank please all the panelists? I'd like to say well done to Carol and Lars for producing such a thought provoking document. Uh, thank you to Kathy and Matt for providing those alternative perspectives away from a sort of traditional major provider. Ajit and Graham for uh, your specific uh, contributions from a professional regulatory body and, and from a qualifications agency. Thank you, Ian, for pulling all this together and leading it uh, on behalf of the Commission. Very much appreciated. And of course, as always, thanks go to Chrissy, who without this, uh, none of it would have, uh, have been possible. So Chrissy, thank you very much indeed. Can I thank everybody who's attended, particularly those who have put in the, the most thought provoking questions, but thank you for your time. And I hope you've enjoyed the last two hours as uh, much as I have. And please, as we've said, you know, do uh, draw down and the, um, the, the latest version of the document and please do uh, regularly visit the Maritime Skills Commission website. Uh, thanks very much indeed, and um, we'll close it there. Thank you. <laughs>